on the very first. Though the angry searches roll on my campus driven soul, I am peaceful for I know. Wildly though the winds may blow, I've an anchor safe and sure that can evermore endure. And it holds my anchor, holds, blow the wildest and no gale on my bark so small and frail. By his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. 420 on the second, mighty tides about me sweep, perils lurk within the deep. Angry clouds or shade the sky, and the tempest raises high. Still I stand the tempest shock, for my anchor grips the rock, and it holds my anchor holds, blows the wildest and no gale. On my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. Let's go to the very last. Troubles almost well the soul, grace like billows o'er me roll. Tempters seek to lure us astray. Storms are cure the light of day. But in Christ I can be bold. I've an anchor that shall hold. And it holds my anchor holds. Blow the wildest then on my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. That's a good one to wake you up, huh? <laughs> Amen. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to bless the service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name very thankful. Lord, for this day, thankful that you are our anchor, thankful, Lord, that you are our guide, and Lord, all good things are coming from you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this uh, Sunday afternoon, and we do pray that you'd please be with Brother Darrell as he studied, and Lord, you'd change courses in the middle of the stream, but Lord, you're, that's your prerogative, and we're very thankful, Lord, for you putting upon his heart what you wanted him to say this afternoon. And so, Lord, strengthen his voice, his mind, and help him, Lord, as he delivers the message. And, Lord, may we apply it to our lives because it's what thus saith the Lord. We just thank you so much for this opportunity. Help us, Lord, now to sing boldly to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's turn now to page 391. 391. Send the light. The light of the world, the light of the world, the light of the world, 391. <clears throat> On the very first, 391, the light of the world. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, his shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No 
Darkness have we who is Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus on the very last. No need for the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind and now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Wonderful singing. Brother Darrell. All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you for staying with us. And for those watching online, we greet you as well. Um, Pastor sure wants to get the nap time real quick, doesn't he? Only singing the first, the second, and the fourth on all the songs. <laughs> There's also the Texans game playing, but we're not going to be any good until next year. This is still a third year rebuild, <laughs> so there's no point in going home watching that. It's, it's nap time. So let's go ahead and let's go to the book of John, please. John chapter 2. For those of that you are here for adult Sunday school, this is going to be eerily similar because it is similar because it's kind of the same. <laughs> we're just going to take a different angle on this. Um, if, if for those that, well, we'll, we'll teach you, uh, we'll, we'll get through that in a second. But in Sunday school, we started off with, uh, in chapter 1 towards the end, where we're, Jesus called five of his 12 disciples. And I know pastors going on Wednesday nights about the 12 disciples. And it's just, how it just lined up on the timeline. So we're, we're, we're not trying to compare notes on purpose. This, if, if this is a coincidence, that's God working anonymously. <laughs> But we're going to be in John chapter 2, after five disciples have been called. We, we uh, see that Jesus, it takes three days for them to travel from where they were to get up to Cana for, their wedding, uh, for a wedding ceremony that they were invited to. Um, I, we're, we're, we're not going to reteach everything point for point that we did for Sunday school, but for, a, for, for those that were not in Sunday school with the adult class, we do need to review. So let's get started. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both the, Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when, they wanted, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And we noted this earlier in Sunday school. A couple of things on this. They were just in town. Jesus was invited, but... They didn't know the plus five was going to be there, so it's Jesus plus five. <laughs> they were going to be, are we going to have enough for everybody? No, you, you can come, you can come, we'll make things stretch. Um, foreshadowing. They're going to make things stretch. And they're, they're just going through, and then Mary just comes to Jesus. Hey, they're running out of wine. Can you, can you, do you, think, you think you can do something to help out? And, it's like, and it starts off with Jesus saying, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Notice he said mother, or not mother, but woman. This is a gentle rebuke that our Savior is giving to his earthly mother. And if he's willing to rebuke Mary, that should tell us something that Mary's not sinless like some religions teach. Um, she had to be rebuked at times as well because she is a sinner just like the rest of us. She just had the honor of bearing Jesus as her son. Um, what have I to do with it? 
literally, why is this my problem? <laughs> It may seem harsh today, but when we're just looking at it, when Jesus says, this, I'm a guest. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be a servant to help out as well. I'm, I'm, I was invited. Can, can I not stay at the dinner table too? It, it's not really my problem, and, but what are you expecting me to do? Conjure stuff up? Mine hour is not yet come. He's, he's, his ministry on earth has not started yet at this point in time. And if he were to start his ministry by a confirmation of a miracle, that's kind of rude on his part. He's at a wedding. He was invited. And he's going to take the spotlight off the married couple for himself to start preaching? That's kind of rude. Mine hour is not yet come. It can't do this just yet. Mom didn't hear this. <laughs> Because verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. He's like, I don't want to hear, can you please help out? <laughs> so he's just there, he's just looking around, then he notices, and there were, in verse 6, there were set there in, in the book of John, chapter 2, uh, verse 6, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing about two or three firkins apiece. And when we were in Sunday school, we, again, we, we went through, uh, through all this, but very quickly, um, the word wine in the Bible translates from the Greek word oikos, which means it may be alcoholic, or it may not have alcohol in it. It all depends upon the context. It can or cannot. We really didn't start differentiating um, wine in alcohol and, um, and not alcoholic wine until American Prohibition, when, when they, they started to have to inspect the shipments going out. And if it didn't have alcohol in it, they started calling it juice at that point because they didn't want to pay for the inspector's time to inspect their product. They didn't want their product to be delayed, so they just started calling it juice. But wine still inferred that it had alcohol, and this is something that's new as of about 100 years. So when Jesus was asked to make wine, he was asked to make alcoholic wine, and that's not what's going to happen because at this point, the guests are well drunk, as it says in a couple verses, and they are inebriated. They are intoxicated. By the way, intoxicated should tell you something. Toxic. <laughs> that should tell you something. So if he were to make alcoholic wine, he's to further in, uh, enable people to sin, which would make him an accessory to sin, which means he would be a sinner himself. If that were the case, he cannot be my savior. So he had to come up with another idea. This is why I think this is the case, because it says he saw, in verse 6, after some water pots of stone after the manner of purifying the Jews. Purifying. These water pots were specifically set off to the side so when, they were, when people are coming into the house, they can clean up and they can have dinner. You're not supposed to eat with unclean hands. Ceremonially speaking, you need to wash up before dinner. It's also a good idea today. But to be ceremonially pure and to purify yourself, they had these water pots specifically set aside for the good water. As compared to, compared to the not so good water. <laughs> but they had six of these water pots. They were made out of stone because the clay it would soggy out after a while. And they were large. The Bible says they were about two to three firkins apiece. Firkin. It is an old English measurement that's not consistent. It is by some sources say it's seven and a half gallons for a firkin. Others say it's eight and a quarter. Others say it's nine. Why can't we just round it off at 10? But these were six pots, two to three firkins a piece. And Jesus said, purifying pots. Got an idea. So Jesus saith unto them, fill the, verse 7, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. 
And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear them to the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then they keep which is the worse. But thou hast kept the good wine till now. So it gets served. And everybody enjoys it. And I'm going to think it's going to sober some people up. Came from a purifying pot after all. Came from Jesus who's not going to allow men to get drunker. And they're, going, they're just tasting it. They're, they're, it's not watered down. It's the good stuff. This is actually where we get the expression that we use today. You save the best for last. It comes from this passage here. And when the ruler of the feast, the party planner, the one that's in charge of all the entertainment and the festivities and lines up all the musicians, and just so everyone can just focus on everything else, the person that's in charge, the wedding planner, tasted this like, oh, you sly little dog here. You, you saved the best for last. You're going to pay me, right? Yeah, yeah, good idea, good idea for you. It's like, I've never heard this before. I'm going to have to talk about you for a time to come. And the bridegroom's like, huh? Okay. Nobody knew. <laughs> the only people that did, at verse 11, thus beginning the miracles, did Jesus and Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. That his disciples were the ones who were helping him out. Only him and the servants knew. Now, there is another instance in our Bible where water gets transformed into something else. This one's all the way back in the book of Exodus, and we're going to tie these two in a second. The book, let's go to the left. Start up page one, you get to the book of Exodus. A couple pages in, after chapter 50 of the book of Genesis, you get to the book of Exodus. And let's go to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. And we're going to start in verse 10. We're going to give a very, we're going to give a context, and then we're going to jump right in. We're going to be reading a lot today, um, but I want you to be reading along, so you're not just taking my word for it, you're reading what the Bible says. And we're just going to make comments on what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 7, verse 10, it, the context is, Moses is a grown man. He's an old man. He's about 80 years old, and he's going to start, start <laughs> his ministry <laughs> at 80 years old. Um, so he and his brother Aaron are going to talk to the king, his name is Pharaoh, and say, let my people go, in that Charleston Heston voice of his. And just let my people go. It's like, what? No, they're our servants. No, not happening. That's our context. The, verse 10 is when they actually go in and talk to him. Aaron threw down his rod to prove that, no, 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 we, we, the, our message is coming from God, and his walking stick turned into a snake. And then Pharaoh's magicians said, we can do that. And they threw their walking sticks, which is actually a trained snake to pretend to be this, throw it down. It's like, I have magical powers. You have to obey me because I come from and serve the gods, but it's just a trained snake. But Aaron's staff actually was wood. Then it became an animal. It ate the other two snakes. And then when he picked it back up, he picked it up by the tail where the snake and flew. But it turned back into a piece of wood. That's power. That comes from God. It doesn't come from fake magicians. Verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before the servants, and he became a servant. Then Pharaoh called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They did also in like manner with their enchantments, and they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. And Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not unto them. And the Lord had said, verse 13, he hardened 
Pharaoh's heart. He, being Pharaoh, hardened his own heart. This is a very big distinction we need to make at this very big, uh, this juncture here. Because there are going to be ten various plagues that are going to affect an entire world power. And it all starts with the Pharaoh hardening his own heart first. There's going to be some passages where it says, and the Lord hardened his heart. But he's only helping Pharaoh's decision to go along. This is an important distinction. Be careful what you wish for, because God might actually help you out with it. He hardened his own heart first. That, that can take an entire different message all by itself, but we need to move on. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out into the water. And thou shalt stand by the river's bank against, um, against uh, he come. The rod which thou turn into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. So Moses, borrow your brother's rod. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, in that Charleston Heston voice, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou shouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, in thou, that thou I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite the rod that is in thine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall turn to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink the water of the river. This is what's going to happen tomorrow. Make sure you crash the party. Verse 19, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams, upon the rivers, upon the ponds, and upon the pools of water. And they become blood, that there may be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and in the vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in all the sight of the servants, and the water that in the river were turned to blood. Now, Pharaoh had another opportunity to say, all right, I'll let you guys go. But he didn't. It is also estimated and believed at this time that Pharaoh is overseeing a ceremony for one of their false gods because he's um, the self-proclaimed God amongst people in, in human flesh. That, that, that idea has been done before. Um, he is a king and a God amongst men. So what better person to officiate the, the, the um, celebration of the Nile flooding? The Nile River floods every year. It's almost like clockwork. When the snows of the mountains in the mountains in the south, when they flow, they fill the water into the rivers, and the waters just flood down. On the way down, they're collecting a whole bunch of minerals and silt deposits with them. And when they hit the coastal land, the coastal land floods. The water comes out of its banks, and the silts that are gathered on the way down in the river, it gets deposited around the, the, the surrounding area as farmable land. This is what science is telling us. What their false religion tells us is that their God, Lord Hapi, H-A-P-I, Hapi, he's picked, uh, depicted sometimes as, a, as blue in body color, <laughs> sometimes with an alligator head, sometimes without. And it's his job to make the rivers flood Oh, he's also called the Lord of the Fish. Coming back to that point in a second. This guy is responsible for making the Nile River's flood every year. Never mind the fact that they saw the snows melt. <laughs> and it's just coming down. And so this is a celebration instance where the Pharaoh is presiding over it. It's flood time. The river's there. I'm a, the false god Hopti did it again. He's like, N no, it's just snowdrift coming down. And gave Pharaoh one more time. He's like, okay, you hardened your heart. Splash into it, and from his rod, the waters start to darken and to muddy and to chum up. And it just spreads throughout the entire river system, downstream and upstream. And 
If you already had a bucket of water that you drew before this, that also turned to blood. The Lord of the fish could not do anything to stop it. As a matter of fact, his little fishies died. Some great protector of God he is. Allowing some other deity to take over his, his one role in this job. He gets one day out of the year and he has nothing and no power to stop it. He was a false god to begin with. He didn't really exist. I say all this to say this. Two different instances. Water got turned into something else. Moses' first miracle was to... Moses' first miracle. Uh, we just read that Aaron threw down his rod and his rod turned to the snake. Then you take the, the snake rod, whack it in the water by Moses, and now an entire ecosystem is destroyed. But Jesus turned water into something else. The blood you couldn't drink. It was loath to drink it, and it lasted for about a week. This one was instantaneous, and everybody rejoiced. And it even sobered them up. There's a little comparison here that we need to do here between Moses and what Jesus did. Moses also wrote the law of God. God said, write these things down. And so for the first five books of the Bible, we're called, it's called the Law of Moses, and it teaches us that man is sinner, and we need help. Then the second guy that turned something into, from water to something else was able to make that happen and fulfill that help. The entire Law of Moses was written so that we know and we recognize, I can't do it. But when Jesus came and lived on earth, he did it. Amen. He came, as, as, as in his own words, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, I came not to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill it. Amen. We're even taught this, by the way. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to the book of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to be reading the entire chapter, and that's okay. The best words that are coming out of my mouth is quoting the scripture. Hebrews chapter 9. Moses gave us the law. The law tells us that we are incapable of holding it and keeping it. And the best that we can try is failure. We are also told in the book of Romans that any type of failure is a death sentence. For the wages of sin is death. There was a little proposition inside the law of Moses that if you just did these animal sacrifices, then we can do this. And then next year, let's do it again. Then next year, we can do it again. And next year, we can. you get the point. But there's a better method. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, and first there was the candlestick, and the table, and the shewbread, and the, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark and the covenant laid round about the gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the cup. Aaron's rod, same one that struck the, the, the Nile River, by the way, the same one that still has a couple snakes on the inside. That one is inside the Ark of the Covenant and the tables of the covenant and over the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat on which we cannot now speak particularly. Right there where he's just describing what's physically in the temple, what was in the tabernacle while they were making everything, while they were doing their... <sighs> supposed to be a month and a half trip which turned into a 40 year, oh we took the wrong turn trip. Um, verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second went the high priest alone, once every year. By the way, while we're studying this chapter, pay attention every time it says the word once. 
this is going to be key to unlocking what this chapter means. Once a year, the priest had to go in with a sacrifice with the bowl of blood to sprinkle it on there so that sins can be forgiven for that year. They did this year in, year out. Um, um, verse 7. But the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost thus signifying, and the way the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while he was as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, which was for the offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them the time of reformation. What they're saying is, the best that you guys can do is to do this bloody ceremony every year. Every year. And it's a picture of something that's going to come later, but it's the best thing you got right now, and it's not a great system. But it's the only thing you got. Believing that you're, you can... Believing in uh, saying, I'm sorry for my sins, and someone else has to die. And in this time frame, it was sacrifices of cows and goats. Or sometimes birds, if you couldn't afford it. And it was always meant to be a picture. It was never meant to be the permanent solution. As a picture, it's not a great system. A lot of innocent animals had to die. You don't even get the meat after it. For some specific sacrifices, some of the priests got some of them, and that's how they fed their families, but not for every single sacrifice. Verse 11, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not this building, specifically the building of the temple or the tabernacle. He's up in heaven doing this ceremony, and that's not made with human. That was made by another hand. By the blood of goats and calves, and, uh, neither by blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth and purifying to the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to the service of the living God. If it was possible for this to be the permanent solution, then my Jesus died in vain for nothing. But all those sacrifices was the picture of what he was to do while on the cross, giving himself for all mankind, not just for a select group, but for everyone that believe. And for those that don't believe, but they just didn't get in on the, on the, on the, um, the promotion. <laughs> if the price has already been paid, do you want on or not? The, 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 if the but Christ's blood is more important than just bulls and goats. And for this cause, verse 15, he is the new mediator of the new he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption and the transgressions that he didn't do by the transgressions that were first uh, under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. The first testament the law written down by Moses because he just wrote down what God said. So God's law said if you are breaking it in any point, you are guilty of everything and you have, you have a death sentence on you already. But when Jesus comes and he sprinkles his own blood in place of you, you have eternal life. And your conscience can even be cleared as well. Verse 16. For where a testament is, 
there must also, of necessity, be the deaths of the testator. There, it has to be signified in blood. It has to be by death. Because that's what the payment for sin is. For a testament is of the force after men are dead. Otherwise, it has no strength all the while the testator lives. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. In order for it to have power, in order for it to have legal binding circumstances, someone has to die. And Jesus died in your place for you so that you don't have to suffer eternal damnation. He did it for you. And when he died, he empowered the New Testament so that we can have forgiveness of sins. And it's by his strength that it's kept, not by ours, his for when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined you into. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood of both the tabernacle and the vessels and the ministry, and all these things are by the law purged by blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It was necessary that it happen, but there is something better than just the blood of bulls, cows, and goats for the remission of sins. It's the blood of Christ. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself unto the high priest entereth into the holy place every year of the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, ah, here's this word again, once. But now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. No longer a yearly religious uh, thing to do. When Christ died, it, did, it stopped everything because it's done. There was no need to go back to the old system. It's the upgraded version. It's Testament 2.0, and it's superior in every way. Not only do you have to, you, you, all sins. There was five different types of sacrifices you had to do in the Old Testament. All of them. One. In the Old Testament, if you sinned once, okay, I gotta go again. I can't wait for the high priest to do it during Passover. That's three months from now. Goodness gracious. So I gotta make my own sacrifice. And so for one sin, one sacrifice, or maybe I'm just gonna get two or three on the same deal. But I got to go back. And there was always a line at going to the temple. There was a line of livestock, a, a whole bunch of birds in cages for the poor and for the goats for the middle, um, middle class and for the upper class. They brought cows. They're just lining up every day because they need their sins covered and forgiven. How many sacrifices in a day is happening? It's enough to, to employ in an, <laughs> 10,000 people to do. That's the old system. And the new. Not daily. Not yearly. Once. Once. 32 A.D. And we don't have to do the system of animal sacrifice anymore for my own forgiveness of my sin. By the way, I'm supposed to die for my sin. Me. No one else did it. But I'm grateful that someone said, I'll take your death penalty on me. 
and I'll do it for you, in Jew, in Jew, for the eight billion people that are currently alive and for the, the estimated um, 13 billion throughout human history. Now, I will take everybody's sin. I will let God pour out his wrath on me as the sins are being placed upon me. And I, I myself will do this and suffer the consequences because I love you. Because he loves us. Jesus said that. He knew full well going into the, what was going to happen the next day. There was cogs in motion and gears in motion already. And he just prayed and stayed up the entire night praying. like, I don't want to do this. But for the sake of my love for these people, for all mankind, past, present, and future, which I'm part of the future, I will sacrifice myself for. But if there's any other way, God, we need to do something about it. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This he prayed in the garden before he was betrayed and put in, tied up in ropes and to be led away where he was then found guilty of false crimes levied against him. The only thing they found him guilty of was him saying, I am God's son. I am God himself. By the way, that was true. So he was only convicted of what was true, but given the death penalty for blasphemy. He was found innocent in Roman law court. He was found or, um, only, he, wasn't, he was found guilty of just blasphemy in the Jewish courts. And for that, they said, kill him. I can, I, I, I can make him... We can, we can just uh, forgive him and then we can just uh, kill this other guy or how about this terrorist? It's like, no, we want the terrorist. Give us Barabbas. The terrorist? You want him back? No, no, no. You don't understand me. I'm willing to pardon one person and you want the terrorist? And that was the day my Savior died. And he willingly went through all that. He willingly said, I know the most horrible portion of human history has thought of this, crucifixion. I'm willing to do this because I love you. Crucifixion, by the way, means of killing is through suffocation with air all around you. The Latin term um, or the English word excruciating comes from the Latin term from crucifixion because it's just that horrible pain to be delivered to any person in human history. And my Savior said, I'm willing to do this because I love you. But it didn't end there at the cross. Because three days later, my Savior, who was dead, rose up from the grave. And he is currently, physically, in heaven, praying to God on my behalf. Hoping that, or waiting for me to pray, the Holy Spirit takes my prayers up to Jesus and Jesus presents it to God. That's his current job. He also has a lot more to do in, in the future, but that's the book of Revelation. We're here in Hebrews. He is alive today. And he can still say, I love you. When I get up yonder, I want to give him a bear hug, and I want to smell what type of shampoo he has and what type of cologne he uses. I want to say thank you. my Savior, brought about an entire system that was better than the past one by the guy that turned a river into blood, the guy that turned water to wine, shed his own blood for me. And let's pray. 
Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us and that you willingly traded your son who did nothing wrong, lived a sinless life to trade it for all of sinful mankind. That's my Savior. That's the love of my God. Help us this day, Father. Oh, help us never get over the fact that we can be saved from sins. And help us to tell one another, you can be saved from your own sins too. And Father, if there's one person here that hasn't given their life over to you, they haven't said, I'm sorry, can I be forgiven as well? Let that person just stop somebody today so we can show them from your word what it means. Help us this day, Father. And just be with us as we go through Monday, Tuesday, and hopefully back Wednesday. If not, then for Sunday for sure. Help us and keep us safe until the next appointed time. In thy son's blessed name do we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.